Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For you. Amen. This is for you that he did this. Well, I've been on quite a journey in the last couple of weeks preparing for this. Um, but I land up realizing, I land up having the makings of a book. Because how can you put everything Jesus has done for us in a few short points? You can't. Every single detail that, G that we hear mentioned in the, the crucifixion story and the resurrection has incredible significance for us today. And we often hear the major points, which is so wonderful in itself. He died for our sins. And we're familiar with Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we were healed. That all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us turned to their own way. And he's laid upon him that iniquity of us all. And how quickly we can say all these things. But what actually is all of that? What was the significance of the reed in his hand, the crown on his head, the stripping and the beating, and the nails in his hands and in his feet, and the piercing of his side? Yes, we know all of that came to fulfill prophecy. But through every detail, Jesus is saying something to you personally today. He's saying, I wore that crown for you. That is a symbol of curses. I became your king. I took the nails in your hands so that everything you touch would be blessed. The curse is broken. So that everywhere you go, you are blessed by me. I bless your coming. I bless your going. I was stripped naked for you, stripped of my identity, stripped of my dignity, and hung naked on the cross, becoming sin for us. Literally, all the sin and all the pain offered a drink of gall to dull the pain. And Jesus said, no, he refused to drink it because he wanted to embrace every one of your pains, every one of your aches, every one of your, your horriblest moments. And he said, he took that within himself until God couldn't even look at him. He was just one big ball of sin. All of our sin combined, he became sin. And at that moment, he, he experienced rejection beyond he was rejected not only by man, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, but he was rejected to where God couldn't even look at him. Why have you forsaken me? Every time we've ever felt rejected or hurt or slighted or wounded or betrayed, he experienced all of that. He was a great high priest who embraced all of it until it was all done. And he could cry, it is finished. It is finished. They took down his body and buried it, and he stayed there. They thought it was all over. It looked like it was all over. What was that all about? All their hopes and their dreams and their aspirations. and It's just like somebody just hit the brakes and everything stopped. And it seemed like all hope was lost. And it's on that springboard I want to start this morning. I had to, I had to start at Resurrection Sunday because there's just too much to cover. What Jesus did for us. But meditate. If you haven't yet learned the art of meditating... There's been many times I've had to stop and say, okay, what was the significance of that, Lord? Why did they barter over your clothes? Why did you do this? Why did Simon of Cyrene, why was he forced to carry the cross? 
And so I hope to get to some of that, but that's another day because we couldn't possibly cover all of that to where you could actually absorb the significance of it all. But when you're feeling that heaven's really not very close and you're really feeling kind of rough and you're feeling like you're had enough of this old earth and everything that you deal with, go to the story of what Jesus did. Just tremendous. And allow yourself to be clothed with his righteousness. He was stripped so he could clothe you with garments of salvation. What do they look like? What do they smell like? He took our, our filthiest garments off and just uh, how can we thank him? What I woke up with Saturday morning was what language could I borrow to thank you dearest friend? How do you say thank you to somebody? Who, who took it all. And we're faced with, every day we're faced with earth. This is earth still. And I'm not underestimating what you still might be going through. You lost somebody, you're battling sickness, you're still feeling alone. Whatever the challenges might be, believe me, there's Something in that story that is the solution. But when he became sin, for everything that's missing the mark that we could actually ever think of, he lay there in the grave. Looked like nothing was happening. Everything was dark. Everybody was crying. Everybody was confused. All the disciples were hiding. Everybody's asking, now what? All hope is gone, it looks like. Meanwhile, he's gone to hell. Literally. He went to hell for three days and he faced the punishment so that you don't have to ever, ever go there. Amen? And he stripped the devil real good. Everybody was laughing in hell real hard while everybody up on earth was crying, but that sure changed quick when Jesus stormed into hell, setting captives free. It's like, what? They were shrieking. They couldn't get out of the way fast enough, and he beat them royally, and he took the keys. And then when that exact time came, the very moment that the third day dawned, there was a suddenly. And now not only everything was shooken, shaken in hell, everything was about to be shaken up on earth. Everything was about to change history forever. Everything was to change in an instant for you when Jesus broke out of the grave. Amen. And with a mighty triumph, he arose. With a shout of victory, he arose. He triumphed over your sin when he died on the cross. He triumphed over hell and the punishment and all of the horrors of hell. And then he came to triumph and bring us victory. And he promises us today, I always cause you to triumph. I always cause you to triumph. I'll always have the last word. And so our very first point this morning is hope. Hope for the hopeless. In Matthew, let's just read a few verses. Matthew 28, 1 to 10. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. 
The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead, and he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. There we go. So verse, the first verse, verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the very first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Jesus was dead. And they just had to go there because there was a sliver of hope. There was a sliver of hope. And as we saw so powerfully displayed in that, in that video clip, they had just seen their brother rise from the dead. They had just taken off the grave clothes and kissed their brother who had been dead. There was a sliver of hope, though, that their Jesus, who was crucified, they saw him being taken out, being dragged away, being laid in a tomb. And yet they're going to look at the tomb. I'm concentrating here this morning on the great exchange for you. Not as a historical fact. But there's always a sliver of hope with Jesus. No matter how dark. No matter how it looks like evil has triumphed. That what could be the solution now? They were probably good as dead men themselves because if they took Jesus out, they saw the horrible things they did to him. They were afraid they were next. Things could not have looked more hopeless ever. They had seen the sneers of the religious. They had experienced it all. They'd seen what they did to their Jesus. But God wants you to know, God wants me to know today, God wants you to know that there is always hope. Because the word says to us, that's the same power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is on the inside of us. Amen. Amen. There's always hope. There's always that suddenly in the spirit, everything could change. History can change. No matter what we see going on politically, no matter what you're going through personally, no matter what's going on in your physical bodies, no matter what's going on in your relationships. Look for the hope. Come to that place of death until we realize and embrace death. Jesus had to die. Something's got to die before it can be risen to life. Amen. God allows sometimes things to die and things to be buried because it can never be everything God wants it to be as long as that thing, death, still is reigning. <laughs> So what is it that Jesus wanted to put to death in us? Paul says, I know what it's like to die daily. I die daily. We have been crucified with Christ. Everything that Jesus went through, we were there. You were there. There's something now on the inside of you the moment you became born again. And he's begun a good work in you. And he wants to put to death those things that are earthly in you. Why? So you can rise to power. So you can rise to newness of life. And for those of us, in the meantime, there is hope. There is always hope. He will always do what he said he was going to do. He does the impossible all over the world again and again and again. He shows people the way of escape. He sets the captives free. He does the impossible again and again and again. We can expect the impossible, but it's, it's so imperative that we look that we stand at the crossroads, that we stand at the place of death. We stand and we wait expectantly, not always knowing exactly what it's going to look like. We can read about the end time that Jesus is coming back again. We know he is. 
But we don't know exactly what it's going to look like. But we stand and look and the Lord says, I'm coming back for those who eagerly await my return. And I'm purifying for myself a people of my own who are eager for good deeds. I'm coming back for those who eagerly await. Amen. Eagerly await. Eagerly look. Eagerly look. So what are those things that God wants to raise to life? Amen. They might be dead. Let them be dead. Let them stay good and dead. Know that Jesus Christ has paid the price. He became that sin. He took that very thing that you think is so impossible. And he took it in himself. He paid the price. He's gone. There's hope. Might, be, might look like Friday. Look like, might look like the enemy won. Might look like he had the last word. It's all over. But we wait and we look in hope. There's always hope for the hopeless. And next, in verse 2, there was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. And going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone and he sat on it. His appearance was like the lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. There is help for you when you need it. Amen. God is saying through this verse, there's help. Help is coming from heaven. David the psalmist knew it quite well. He'd say, I'm calling on you. I'm saying, help, Lord. Do you ever read... Read my lips, Lord. I need help. I need your grace. I need your wisdom. I need your help. Help is coming from heaven. There's still angels that are commanded to minister to the heirs of salvation. And there's all of a sudden, there's help when you need it. Signs and angels and miracles. There's power on earth. There's still the power is available. There's power from heaven. Amen. Jesus holds a scepter. He is the king. He gets the final word. We, as we look to him and we say help, he still rolls away your stones. What are stones? Stones are obstacles. Stones are things that are too heavy for you. Stones are things you need help with. Mary and her sister couldn't move the stone. It's impossible. It was rolled into a rut and it was put there and it wasn't going anywhere. But the angels of the Lord. But the angels of the Lord. But help cometh. And when you're in the midst of a storm, when you're in the midst of a battle, as we all are, help is on its way. Help is on its way. Help from heaven. God hears your cry. Maybe your prayer is just one big help. Help! SOS God! And then heaven touches earth. And everything changes. Amen. Help is on its way. Next we see point three. Is faith always trumps fear. Love always has the last word. Amen. There's a clashing of kingdoms that's going on here. There's a literal clashing of kingdoms and there is a clashing of kingdoms at all time. We declare and we call forth, thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Because it's not too hard for you, God. And to you gives all the glory. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. When there's that clashing of kingdoms. But faith triumphs. In verse 4 to 16, the guards were so afraid they shook. I read, there's a whole lot of shaking going on in this story. The earth quaked. Guards are quaking and shaking. Everybody's shaking. Some are shaking out of fear. Hell is shaking. As God, all these dead come and arise from the dead. Jesus wasn't the only one. When there was an earthquake, many saints showed up at the doorstep. Can you imagine? A knock at the door. Rick, what are you doing here? <laughs> The power of God is shaken. And, and as we see the culmination of history, 
we are seeing a clashing of kingdoms. Now they're definable. Maybe 10, 20 years ago, we couldn't define them very closely, but it's really black and white. It's good and evil. And there is a clashing of kingdoms. God is still on the throne. Why do the nations rage? Why do they plot in vain against the Lord and his anointed? But the word says he sits in the heavens and laughs. Because it's a big divine setup. Just like the crucifixion was a divine setup. Because God knew Resurrection Sunday was coming. Amen. He knew there was a suddenly. He knew that there were angels and the power and the glory was his and his alone. And that help was on its way for those who are going through trials. And that there is always hope in him. And faith always triumphs. Amen. Faith trumps fear. As the angel appeared... The guards were afraid. They were in big trouble. And they knew it. They were not right with God. But the angel said to Mary, Martha, fear's got no place in your heart. Don't be afraid. Fear's not for you. We have a choice. Are we going to embrace? We're not to be afraid as the world is afraid. Have there been times when what you're going through literally makes you shake, quivers on the inside of you, makes you shake, and there's a clashing of kingdoms, and you could be afraid or you could reach out in faith for that hand that is always extended. Choose faith. Now to him who is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all you could ask or think or even imagine. This was happening before their eyes. There comes a moment when faith is actualized. And guess what? Everything you have ever hoped for, everything you have ever dreamt of, everything you've ever asked for, every promise that you have ever claimed in the book, there's coming a day when that faith will not prove you wrong. And you will say, I am so glad I chose to keep believing God. Because what is fear? Fear is being more sure of what the devil can do. It's faith inverted. It's having faith in the enemy. That his plots and schemes against your life are greater than God's power and faith in what he could do. Now to him who is able to do exceeding and abundantly and above all you could ask or think or imagine. So we need to declare, I will trust in you, Lord. I will trust in you. You might be quaking on the inside and the devil might be making your flesh scared, but you declare, I will cast my care onto you for you're able to care for me. Amen. Heaven shook, hell shook, the earth quaked. God has a way of turning terrible stories into terrific testimonies. Terrible stories. And there can be many crises to a story. Have you ever read a really good book? And the guy just escapes one hell hole, just escapes all the flying bullets and whatever else he's going through. And it's like you barely have time to catch your breath and here comes another one. But you're getting closer and closer and closer to the victory. Amen. You just don't stop. Love always perseveres. Love never fails. We got to know that God's way is always the way. To put our faith and our hope and our trust in God Almighty. Who says, my arm is not too short to save. I have the solution. Are you going to trust me while I'm working it out? I'm working it out. Between Friday and, Earth and Easter Monday... Things did not look good. But in your heart you go, Resurrection Sunday's coming. We know the end of the story. Amen. We choose faith no matter how bleak things get, how horrible they get, no matter how many churches they bomb or what kind of poison they're going to put in our water and our air. It doesn't matter. God is going to have the final word. Oh, death, where is your sting? What's the best the devil can throw at you? Amen. Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who could kill the body. But fear rather... Fear rather the one who can take you down. Amen. Let godly fear. 
the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. Choose life. I set before you today, the Lord would say to you, life and death, blessing and curses. I choose. Are you going to be afraid of the world? If you're on the world side, you've got a whole lot to be afraid of because it's not going to be very pretty. But if you know the one who holds the world in his hands, who paid the price, who redeemed the earth, he's a lamb slain before the foundations of the world. He is a lamb who takes away the sin of the world, slain before the foundations of the world. He's the God who calls the end from the beginning. Amen. He was slain before the foundations of the world. He has the solution. He has life and blessing. He says, choose it. Choose faith. Choose to hope. Choose to put your trust in my word. Because heaven and earth might pass away. But my word and my promises will never pass away. Amen. Glory to God. The last point I want to make is God's promises always trump over Satan's plots, schemes. Make no mistake, there is a plan against you. There is a plan that has been, the enemy's like a roaring lion. He, he knows, he's just waiting for that moment to take us down. He knows that exact, he knows our habits, he knows our weaknesses, he knows it's like if I just bide my time, just a matter of time, that person's going to come up from undercovering. Amen. But God's promises trump Satan's plots, plans, and schemes. And there's always the escape hatch. There's always the grace of God. God's love and his grace and his mercy are multiplied to you every day. It's not hard. My yoke is easy. My burden's light. So Jesus said to you today, take your cross. Amen. Take it up every day. Take up that cross and follow me. Amen. He's got a plan. His plan is wonderful. Yes. Don't be afraid of the devil's plots, but don't be ignorant of them either. We are not unaware, the Bible says, of his plans. We are not ignorant of how the enemy works, how he wants to take us down. Guess what? I got good news for you. Nothing can keep you from the divine destiny God has for you because he who began a good work in you, he's bringing it to completion. Stay on that path that he has prepared for you. Amen. Choose a life. Choose resurrection power. Choose a life and follow hard after Jesus Christ. Amen. Put a demand on that resurrection power. Put a demand on that. Choose to walk in life and liberty. Choose. It's all, shake it off. The devil comes and bite you. He's like an ankle biter. And he comes around and he's sniffing at your heels. Shake him off in Jesus name. I've chosen the high road. I've chosen Jesus. I have... I have decided to follow Jesus. Amen. And it is no longer I that live, but Christ that liveth in me. That's you. His power. His wisdom. All that he is is available and is on the inside of you. Put a demand on it. Bring glory to God. Walk in the kingdom. Walk in his kingdom power. Amen. Walk in that kingdom. What does it look like? It's righteousness. Live right. Not by your own might or power, but by his spirit, saith the Lord. Keep in step with the Spirit. That means one step at a time. One step at a time. Don't they say that? Uh, to some of these addicts, they go one day at a time. One day at a time. Victory is found in the moment. It is in the moment. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus gets the last word. Amen. Amen. His plans, his purposes, his promises, they're all yes and amen to you. He doesn't say yes to you and no to you. They're all made available. And that's how we conquer. How do we obtain those promises? By faith and patience. We'll obtain all the promises of God. And God gets all the glory. God gets all the glory. 
God is saying, I love you so much. I've demonstrated my love in this. While you were yet a sinner, while you were running from me, while you were my enemy, while we were Christ's enemies, we were reconciled through his blood. How much more? Won't you triumph and reign in life through his life? Through his resurrection life that's on the inside of you. When you were crucified with Christ, you were also raised with him to newness of life. That's what it's for. It's for you. Amen. So let's just stand to our feet. Let's receive it. Glory to God. Thank you, God. Father, you are so good. I just want to invite the worshipers. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. God is so good. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You need to receive a resurrection miracle. Maybe not for you. Maybe for somebody you love. Were you saying, I'm appropriating that resurrection life? Oh, the victory is found in his life. Thank you, Father. I'm joining with your faith. I can see faith. Jesus said he could see people had faith to be healed. I can see when people have faith and they're grabbing hold. Amen. Lay hold of that hope. Lay hold of that hope and say, help is on its way. Hallelujah. I'm not letting go of the promises of God. It's like a plow. You're hanging on with both hands. In the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise and glory today that you loved us so much. That while we were yet sinners, you sent your only begotten son to die on the cross. That we might have forgiveness. That we might have life. And that more abundantly. Thank you, Lord. We're embracing it today. We want to say thank you, almighty God, for what you've done. Lord, we know if that's how horrible we were and you paid such a great price, we know that you have caused us to be saved and healed and delivered by your life, by your resurrection life. And Father, today, right here, right now, we're joining our faith. We're coming together in agreement, Father, that wherever there is death, wherever there is death, whether it's in someone's physical body disease realm, whatever's of the death realm, Father God, whether it's strongholds that still are hanging on tenaciously to gain control of the will of man, that Lord, we declare that power has been broken now in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Loose the captives. We say, come for Lazarus, come out. Come out of those death cave. Come out of those grave clothes. Thank you, Father. And we praise you that even now, Father, there are suddenlies happening in the spirit. And resurrection life is springing up. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Devil, you've been found out. You've been stripped. The keys have been taken from you and you got nothing on us. Hallelujah. Let's go out and praise him real good. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We're praising him. Praising him. Shana Masiara.